Good morning, everybody. This is the best conference so far for the FDRS. So thank you to Cheyenne and the rest of the board. Amazing. So I am going, and, and another amazing thing is that there are more talks on Durkheim's disease in this conference than ever before. So I'm, I have a whirlwind talk, so here we go. So there's my title. And there's my disclosures. Happy belated Easter. <clears throat> so I'm going to start talking about Madeline's disease. And it's better known as multiple symmetric lipomatosis because there are multiple lipomas on the body. But I'm so used to calling it Madelung's disease that I hope you don't mind. That's what I'm going to call it as I go through because it's going to come off my tongue. So Madelung's disease usually presents with increased fat tissue on the upper part of the body as opposed to lipedema, which is usually increased fat on the lower part of the body. And there are actually lipomas within the fat tissue. And we know some of the genetics of Madelung's disease, which I'm going to get into, but I felt like this was a very interesting presentation of Madelung's disease, and it gives us some in, a little bit more insight into the disease. So this is a 61-year-old man. He presented to a clinic complaining about these increased masses on his upper body, his upper arms, his shoulders, and his chest. And I think when you look at those arms, what do you think about? You think about lipedema, right? That's, that's a typical lipedema arm. So his clinical history included 35 years of alcohol abuse. And Madelung's disease is well known to be associated with uh, alcohol abuse. And he needed a liver transplant because his uh, liver started to fail because of the alcohol use. So he got a transplant, and it was from a normal, healthy German donor. So they don't think that the Madelung's disease was transferred to him from the donor. It was probably associated with the alcohol use that maybe triggered a gene, but then why didn't he present with Madelung's disease before the transplant? So it may be that the transplant was a traumatic event, which generated um, an activation of the immune system, or it could be that the immunosuppressant drugs that he was on actually, at that point, had enough information to trigger the Madelung's disease. So we don't really have the answer there, but I, th I think it's intriguing that just because you have a gene for Madelung's disease doesn't mean you're gonna get it. Something else might have to happen. So to talk about the next case, I need to talk a little bit about adipocytes, which are near and dear to our heart, right? So most of our adult bodies have white adipocytes, and these adipocytes store energy, they insulate us thermally, they protect us mechanically, and they're actually endocrine organs and they secrete a lot of adipokines and, and cytokines. And they give us our shape, right? So super important. On the bottom are brown fat cells. And brown fat cells express a protein called UCP1, or uncoupling protein 1. And what they do instead of, this protein does is instead of helping you store energy, it helps you release it as heat so it keeps you warm. So babies have un, a lot of brown fat with uncoupling protein 1, and hibernating animals do as well. And then look at that, that adipocyte in the middle. It's kind of a mixture between a, a white adipocyte and a brown adipocyte, and they call it beige or bright adipocyte. And it also has the marker UCP1. So there also is some thermal activity associated with these bright or beige adipocytes. And they're activated by cold, so cold therapy, good, and by the adrenergic or sympathetic nervous system, so norepinephrine, epinephrine, which you can get by fasting. And so this is a man who has Madelung's disease, um, just a terrible presentation. It spread over a good portion of his body. And it was a very simple study, but what they did was they biopsied the affected area and the unaffected area, and they found that UCP1, which is that dark brown color, was present whether the Madelung's disease was there or not. And that suggests that there is something genetic causing this increase in UCP1 or this change in adipocytes in the body. So it doesn't matter where it is, and it can spread to different areas, just like lipedema can spread to different areas. So there is a known mutation for Madelung's disease called, called mitofunction 2, and I talked about this previously. Now there's a second mutation to cause Madelung's disease, and it's in a gene called MTTK, 
And this gene codes for uh, the tRNA for lysine. And tRNA helps translate the DNA into protein. So it's kind of the messenger in between. And there's lots of different tRNA messengers, and this particular one is for lysine. And <clears throat> if you have this mutation, you could get myoclonic epilepsy with red ragged fibers. So your muscles look all raggedy. So having a mutation in this tRNA lysine causes problems in proteins throughout the body, including the muscle. And it may change adipocytes into beige or brown adipocytes. And you can see that on um, in this individual, he is very affected um, on the uh, upper neck and the back. And he also had these um, thickened areas on his fingers that actually peeled off. So that may be a sign that we need to look for in our patients for this particular gene. So what about treatment for Madelung's disease? So this is a 56-year young female. She was diagnosed to have the MTTK gene. She was a carrier. And she obviously grew increased Madelung's tissue on her back, um, which was quite deforming. She had three kilograms of fat removed, so it's about six pounds. And after the surgery, she declined. She had a, a decline in her functional capacity, in her quality of life, and she became actually disabled after the surgery. So surgery isn't always the best thing. So on her own, she went on a carbohydrate-restricted diet. And by one year, she had met all her goals. She was more functional. The, the lipoma deposits on her back had reduced in size. She had better exercise tolerance, and she actually went back to work. And you can see by 91 months, almost all of her abnormal tissue is gone. The, um, we're going to hear about an injectable for Durkheim's disease, but this is deoxycholic acid, which um, failed to reduce the, the chin tissue in a man with Madelung's disease. Do I really only have seven minutes left? No, you've got, you've got Thank you. I was like, I'm like, I can't talk that fast. <clears throat> so um, deoxycholic acid is a, a bile, so it's like a detergent, and it dips, disrupts the fat. So if you can disrupt the fat, then your body can process it and get rid of it, which would be great, and you don't have to have surgery. So he had his uh, chin injected in January of 2018, and he came back, and it had recurred. And you would think he would say, like, I don't want this anymore. But what he said was he had avoided having surgery because of this injection. It had improved his quality of life and decreased the need for him to be cut, and he wanted to continue the injections. So uh, <clears throat> it's not just about how you look and reducing the size. It's about your quality of life and your risk, right, of going under the knife. So let's move on to Durkheim's disease. So this is a woman with familial multiple lipomatosis type of Durkheim's disease. She has multiple large lipomas on her body, and she came to me right after she'd had multiple removed, and of course she looks like she got hit by shrapnel, and <clears throat> she doesn't like the way she looks, but she wanted those painful lumps gone. Wouldn't it be great if we could do something else besides surgery in patients with Durkheim's disease? So, uh, a student of mine, Natalie Munguia, uh, Dr. Moza Yeni, Dr. Wright, who is here, and I, um, because of the Raziel study that you'll hear about, we had to prove to the FDA that Durkheim's disease was a rare disease. And you heard from Cheyenne Brinson that we are members of NORD because multiple symmetric lipomatosis and Durkheim's disease are rare diseases. So, but there's no real proof in the literature that it's rare. So. We looked at a bunch of physician practices, and we are referral sites, so we're going to be more saturated with patients who have Durkheim's disease. So the numbers aren't going to be great, and they're probably going to, when we estimate the prevalence, it's really going to be higher than actual. So what we all estimated was that based on our individual practices and other physician practices, that there were probably less than 150,000 people with Durkheim's disease in the United States. And to be a rare disease, you have to have less than 200,000. So right there, we, call, we qualified. So then we went into the literature and we looked at different populations to see if we could guesstimate the prevalence of Durkheim's disease. And we looked at um, published studies. We looked at databases. We, looked on, uh, we 
ask questions on social media and we did internet searches. And what we found was that there are probably less than 40,000 people in the US that have Durkheim's disease. So that qualifies it as a rare disease. Are any of these numbers accurate? Yeah, not exactly, but at least they begin to give us estimates before we do a true prevalence study. Also, while we were gone, uh, we published a paper on infections that preceded the development of Durkheim's disease. And I think uh, Linda Ann Kahn can support me in this, that we see a lot of patients that come in who have, who have an infection like Lyme disease. And in this case, uh, we had seven individuals. Two of them had fungal infections. One had coccidiodomycosis, or valley fever, and the other one had uh, histoplasmosis. And the rest of them had Lyme disease plus other ancillary infections. And they stated that after those infections, they started to have the signs and symptoms of Durkheim's disease. And this is an example of a lipoma that we resected from one of the individuals. So what... Is it that second hit? Do you need the gene and then something else has to happen like an infection? Or does the infection actually affect the tissue so it's more likely to form lipomas? Would love to hear your thoughts. So back in 2017, my student Karen Beltran, who was an undergrad at the time and now she's a physician, she and I looked at all of my patients and I said, how many of them have lipedema? How many of them have Durkheim's disease? And what's the difference between the two? Because I felt that it was on a spectrum. And we found that a number of individuals had both lipedema and Durkheim's disease. And they, they had the shape of lipedema, their tissue felt like lipedema, they had all the other signs and symptoms of lipedema, but they had these big lipomas in their tissue as well. What, what are those? I mean, what do they really have? So this is a paper that came out um, just recently by Uwe Wulina, and he states that women with lipedema can also have Durkheim's disease, so he's in agreement with us. And this was a very interesting example of that, so you can see that the leg on the left is a lipedema leg, and the leg on the right has a lot more fatty tissue around the knee, which is why it's called juxta-articular, I mean it's around the joint. And bruising, very common in lipedema, that was seen, am I getting my legs right? Yeah, seen on the left leg, <laughs> but not on the right. So again, a difference between the two. Hypothermia on the left leg, not on the right. And what he says is, uh, you can use liposuction to remove the lipedema tissue, but a lot of times with Durkheim's disease, you're gonna have to excise it because it's so fibrotic and there's a lot more of it. So what are the genetics of Durkheim's disease? There's really not any gene yet, but there's some provocative data. So there's a, three genes that I put up here that um, have been associated with lipedema, but because we have maybe that crossover between the two, they might be important in Durkheim's disease as well. The first one is BUB1, which is a regulator of proteins involved in cell proliferation. So if you have higher cell proliferation, you could get lipedema, you could get Durkheim's disease. And then out of the UK, they uh, found this, this gene, it's so long, LHFP or LHFPL6, which is a member of the lipoma HMG1C high mobility group protein isoform C fusion partner gene with lipomas. Say that 10 times fast. But this, has been, this particular locus has been well known for years to be associated with the development of lipomas. And that means that people with lipidema can form lipomas too. And how does that relate to Durkheim's disease? We don't have the answers, but how interesting is that? And then BBS4 um, causes a gender-specific increase in adipose tissue in females. So that sounds like it could be an important gene in lipedema, but more women are affected with Durkheim's disease than men. So it could be an important gene for Durkheim's disease as well. Now, I mentioned that in Madelung's disease, there was the MT... I think it's MTTK, MTKT variant. And they actually looked at that variant in patients with Durkheim's disease and they did not have it. So I think that kind of separates 
Madelung's disease from Durkheim's disease, at least for this particular gene. So here's a study where they uh, looked at uh, only seven individuals with Durkheim's disease, again a small study, and I think you heard from um, Guy Eakin this morning that we really need thousands of people to do accurate genetic studies, but when you have a rare disease, you kind of take what you can get. So in this particular study, they looked at all the, the different variants and genes that they could find in the whole um, exome. And they classified these variants according to the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics as either pathogenic, meaning damaging, or a variant of unknown sequence. So they know that there's a change, but they don't know if it's damaging or not. They don't know if it's important or not. And you can see that they found a whole list of genes that had variants in them and there were a few that were pathologic. And then you can see the pathways that were affected. And what I found was very interesting is that um, for the top one, the ABCC8, it affects insulin secretion. And one of the things that we, we found quite some time ago in patients who have Durkheim's disease is that, is that they're insulin resistant and that there's a high risk of type 2 diabetes in the population and there's a lot of metabolic disease in the population. So this may be a very important pathway. And I think you can see that um, IRS2, which is um, the insulin one of the insulin receptors, there was a variant of unknown uh, significance in that particular gene, again, conferring insulin resistance. So when we have a patient with Durkheim's disease, one of the things that we do right away is we say, are you insulin resistant? If you are, we need to treat that. We need to get your, in, your insulin resistance under control and get your inflammation down because inflammation makes Durkheim's disease worse. So that's super interesting. <clears throat> and then you see the THRA gene. That's important in thyroid hormone signaling. That was a likely pathogenic mutation. How is the thyroid involved? There's a lot of you know, autoimmune disease associated with the thyroid. There's a lot of hypothyroidism in the lipidema population, as well as in the Durkheim's disease population. So we have now insulin signaling, which is an endocrine disease, and the thyroid, which is an endocrine organ. So does Durkheim's disease belong in endocrinology? <clears throat> Possibly. <laughs> now, there's a bunch of other signaling pathways, and you probably want to know what those mean. So here's looking at one of the pathways, the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway, and there is a quiz at the end, so please play, pay close attention. I think you can see at the bottom that this particular pathway is involved in cell proliferation. So if you have a mutation, maybe it can't keep proliferation of fat under control. So this may be an important pathway. Here's your HIPPO pathway. Again, this is involved in cell proliferation. It has been shown to affect, to cause obesity in animal models. Could this be a good model for Durkheim's disease? Should we be looking for, for genes that are affecting this pathway and that are affecting adipocytes? And how do they affect white adipocytes versus the brown or beige, beige adipocytes? And here's your RAS MAP kinase signaling pathway. And again, if you can see, look on the the end here, oh, it doesn't work. Um, you can see that it, this pathway affects both brown adipocytes and white adipocytes. So again, it's interesting that we're looking at Madelung's disease and looking at white and brown adipocytes, but maybe we're looking at white and brown adipocytes in Durkheim's disease as well. So is Durkheim's disease a mitochondrial disease? So I, I believe so. I have been talking about Durkheim's disease as a healing disorder for years, and this is based on Dr. Robert Navio's work from UCSD. And what's interesting is patients with mitochondrial disease often experience an average of 16 symptoms. And I think what makes treating patients with Durkheim's disease hard is they have so many signs and symptoms. And you can spend a whole hour just going through each and every one of them. And that's frustrating for you as a patient, and it's frustrating for providers because we really want to help. We just don't know where to start. And what's even more interesting is that mitochondrial disease impacts body parts that require the greatest amount of energy. And when I see all of the checkboxes for signs and symptoms in 
muscle checked off, I'm like, oh, that person might have Durkheim's disease. And I've been thinking that way for years. So problems with muscles, problems with the brain, which we kind of mentioned last night. Um, the brain is often affected in Durkheim's disease. There are, there are cognitive difficulties, memory issues, word finding issues. That's a big complaint. Everyone says, I've been, I, you know, I was, I was brilliant when I was younger. I, could, I had a photographic memory and now I can't remember things. That's not, that's not cool, right? Is there a risk for Alzheimer's disease and dementia? What about the heart? Lots of people complaining of palpitations, uh, shortness of breath, the lungs. Fatty liver, super common in Durkheim's disease, and the GI tract, lots of IBS symptoms. So, multiple organ systems are involved. Mitochondrial disease should be a consideration for Durkheim's disease. So, there's the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation. They have a call out right now, and they're doing a pilot testing program. And they're looking, they're using machine learning to identify the best undiagnosed patient candidates to receive testing based on information that you as a patient provide yourself. So it's empowering you to look into testing to see if you have a mitochondrial disease, and I just love that. You have to be a resident of the United States. Sorry about that for anyone out of the US that's watching. And you cannot previously had whole exome or whole genome sequencing. And I think, you know, not a lot of people have. This is an expensive test. It's difficult to get covered by insurance. So you can go to that link, answer their questions, and see if you, you fit as a candidate for mitochondrial disease. And I don't think this is only for uh, Durkheim's disease. I think this is for Madelung's disease and perhaps some of you out there who have lipedema as well. So treatments for Durkheim's disease. So I've been saying for years, make a tiny incision to get the lipoma out. Don't do a really large cut. Doing a really large cut does a lot of dam damage to that vascular plexus that's under the dermis. So there's uh, blood vessels, lymphatics, nerves. So this particular group, the, what they do is they um, inject lidocaine and epinephrine. They grab the lipoma. They do a four millimeter punch box. They boom, and then they core the, the lipoma out, they clean it out with some saline, and they go back in and they make sure that, that they get everything, right? They don't leave anything behind, even you know pieces of connective tissue, which also are important in Durkheim's disease. And then they close them up and they've had no, no recurrence. And for recurrence, if you remove the lipoma, it can't recur, it's gone. But you don't want to stimulate the lipomas next door. Like aunt, I call them like Aunt Myrtle and Uncle Sam, right, who are sitting next door and want to grow. So you want to do it as minimally as possible so as not to disturb, disturb nearby lipomas. You'll hear about the Raziel study today, um, which has an injection, which I'm just not going to talk about anymore because you're going to hear about that. And the last time we were together, we talked about um, FREMS as a treatment for Durkheim's disease. So this is electrical stimulation. It's, it's kind of like a TENS unit in a way, but it's not because it has variable sequences. It just doesn't zap you and zap you and zap you the same. It's got um, differing uh, levels of electrical stimulation. And in this particular study, they had the patients put the electrodes where their pain was on their body. And then the patient could crank it up as high as they wanted, as high as they were com comfortable with. Again, this is a patient-centric approach, which I absolutely love. And then they treated them over a year. And I know this is a busy slide. This is the da um, their data. But they looked at a visual anal analog scale for kind of global pain, and they didn't see significance. But what they found significance in was people had better physical functioning. Who doesn't want that, right? They, ha um, they uh, rated their physical health. Their overall physical health improved. Their body pain reduced. And they had more vitality. Like, I want more vitality, too. So I think um, this is something that we should look into, and I think the best treatment would be not where you have to go into a clinic and get your FREMS treatment, and then you go back home, but you have a FREMS unit at home, right? And finally, this is a deoxycholic acid injection for Durkheim's disease. This is that bile. This is that detergent. I'm not su a super big fan of putting detergent into tissue, 
Um, I, I think that some people's bodies don't handle the detergent, especially those who have mast cell activation disease, which we're going to hear about um, later by Dr. Larry Afrin. But they injected um, into this lipoma and they shrunk it by about a centimeter. And pain went down. So if your pain goes down, you know, you might be happy enough with that. So in conclusion, Madeline's disease or multiple symmetric lipomatosis, um, I'm concluding, um, and Durkheim's disease are considered to be rare diseases. And the etiology of Durkheim's disease remains unknown, but might involve multiple pathways which could be used as drug targets, right? That's kind of what we want. We want some treatments. We don't necessarily want drugs, but we'll take them if they work. And the origin of, of adipose tissue in Madelung's disease may be brown or beige adipocytes, or a transformation of white adipocytes into brown or beige. And so that, those pathways are currently under study. And I think for anyone who has Madelung's disease or Durkheim's disease, that a low carbohydrate diet makes sense, right? Whatever low carbohydrate diet that is for you, and I think it's a good idea to pursue nutritional help to find one that you'll stick with because it's not a diet for six weeks. It's an it's a eating plan for life. And finally, I think injections for both of these diseases uh, may be considered to reduce the need for surgery. So thank you so much. Presentation, Dr. Herb, as always. We have a lot of questions for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of unrelated questions. So if you asked an unrelated to this topic question, we will not be, uh, we won't be able to address them right now, but maybe a little bit later. Okay. First question, what type of testing, um, genetic testing do you do for Durkham's? I mm -hmm. currently don't do any genetic testing for Durkham's. There's no, there's no known gene, but I think we should watch the literature closely because for the first time, they're actually publishing potential, potential genes for it. So. My family has a cluster of different disorders, lipedema, thyroid, uh, mast cell, large cell, yeah, a lot of different things. Um, and they, this is all in first degree relatives. Do you think we would benefit from genetic testing and where would be the best place to have it done? Wow, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> I mean, we don't know the genes for a lot of those diseases. I know that there are some mitochondrial mutations we know for mast cell activation disease, but that requires getting the mast cells, so that's a little complicated. Again, we don't know the, all of the genes for even uh, Madelung's disease, um, and we certainly don't know the gene for Durkheim's disease. So I think um, genetic testing is a little bit early, and I think you have to ask yourself, if I get tested and they find some variant, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do with that variant? So I prefer to treat people clinically right now until we really know the gene because um, different treatments for variants of unknown significance could cause side effects. Is there anything stem cell related as cause or treatment in Durkheim's? I've had, a, I've had quite a few patients uh, who underwent stem cell treatments some of them actually had really good benefit and some did not. And so we have so little data on using stem cells to treat diseases, especially rare diseases like Madelung's disease or Durkheim's disease. So it's a very expensive procedure. There's no guarantee that the stem cells are going to work. So I think it's too preliminary to recommend it. But luckily, we have some stem cell investigators in the audience, including uh, my former fellow, Sarah Algodban. So hopefully this next generation will come up with some answers for stem cells because I think they have great potential for treatment. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Herbs. And for those of you... Just one more.